Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode five of the CG Show. With me today, Mr. D. Muzanes, a goal, a former goalkeeper from Melbourne City. He's had a great career playing across Europe. He's played in major countries, England, Greece, the Netherlands, and has played at massive clubs such as Liverpool, Ardis, Oldham United, Melbourne City, Peck Swaller, and is now at Sutton United in England. You've won a number of titles, including the FFA Cup and the Asian Champions League. Dean, thank you so much for being here. I've, uh, oh, we needed to have this conversation a couple of weeks ago, but we got stuck into lockdown. You were supposed to come in the studio. We were supposed to do it in person, but we got stuck because of lockdown. And then you had to pack your bags and fly away from because you left Melbourne City onto the next chapter of your life, which is Sutton United. How are you, big fella? Good, mate. Pleasure being on your show. Um, but, yeah, I'm buzzing at the moment. Uh, currently in uh, London, things happen so quick. So, yeah, just can't wait to get started here and, and uh, see where the next adventure takes me. How have you been finding You've probably been there for now about 12 days or so. How have you been finding it settling in? You're back with Steph, your partner, Steph Catley, who's also now signed at Arsenal Women. So that's been huge, and I'm sure it's amazing that you guys have linked up where she got a deal in England. You were like, stuff this, i got to find a deal in England. And <laughs> and I know you, I've known you personally for a number of years. So knowing that you've had long distance relationships, I'm sure it's been bloody hard. So I'm sure that's amazing that you are, you guys are back together. Yeah, of course. Look, um, you know, I've, I've been fortunate enough to have, to have a, have a good career and seen a lot of the world. Um, and, you know, I've met, I've met Steph four years ago who, you know, things are serious, you know, things are going great. She's uh, done fantastically well in, in, in uh, getting a, a, a contract at Arsenal. And uh, for us, it was, uh, it was important that we could still do our uh, careers and focus on our careers and, and, and support each other the best that we could in what we're doing. Um, and for myself, having played uh, in the A-League for, for a four, four years now, I think it is, and... Um, you know, to, to, have, to have won some things there and being part of some special moments in my career in the A-League, I felt that it was time to, to, to try and get back into England. Um, I didn't realise that I could uh, live with Steph and, and, be, and be with Steph. I was just hoping to get a club in England because uh, at the moment with coronavirus, it's actually very difficult. Uh, you know, everything that's going on in the world, not, not just in football, but in, in general life. Uh, but, you know, Sutton United um, had been tracking me and seeing that Steph had signed at Arsenal and gave me the opportunity to come back to London and uh, and fulfil my dream and, and, and also support Steph and, and, and be together. Good on you, man. I think we'll we'll touch on a bit of uh, England and all that jazz, but just, just quickly, what's the rundown with the, the season? So obviously it's warped at the moment because everything's just been thrown out of whack with Champions Leagues running every week and, and all that jazz. But what's, you know, what's your, how, when, when does your season start and how does it look for you over the next couple of months? So I got here two weeks earlier uh, before our pre-season starts. Uh, our set precinct starts uh, this Saturday. Um, but there's all these protocols and things that we must do as a club or as a league, every league actually, from the Premier League down. Uh, there's all these uh, protocols that you need to do and fulfill before you can start getting into group trainings and stuff like that. So we've just been having meetings and and and, and seeing what we need to do to, to ensure that the league goes ahead in a safe environment for the fans and the players. Um, and by Saturday, you know, we, we should start um, our training and uh, and go from there. And then six weeks later is the first game of the season on October three. Wow, that's a pretty that's a pretty quick turnaround. I think for yourself, well, being in Australia, yeah, you you've been training um, with Melbourne City and the season's been running. Uh, but how about everyone else at the club? When did their seasons run off? And how are you feeling? Obviously. Are you, are you feeling fit to be ready in six weeks? Yeah, well, look, I was in a bit of a fortunate situation because the A-League came back and I had trained for five, six weeks at Melbourne City. You know, everything at Melbourne City is, is, is fantastic. You know, they do everything to, to, to the best of their abilities. You know, you get fit. You know, you got everything there to, to become strong. So I was lucky enough to to 
be able to go back to Melbourne City or stay at Melbourne City and and, and train there. And then this opportunity came came while I was there. Um, so, you know, I, I had to take it. But the lads in England, everything has stopped for a few months now. So they've been given off-season programs. Yes, they've been keeping fit. Yes, they have uh, been going into the gym. But there's only so much you can do on your own. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's not the same unless you're... So they're at a certain uh, fitness, but you know that's what the preseason is there for. So you can so you can get your fitness back. And then, just in regards to fans, when do they suspect? Is there going to be fans there in six weeks, or is that completely pushed out to at least next year? Like, is there any word on that? Yeah, well, to be honest, I, I don't know. I've been hearing whispers. I've been hearing rumors that they want to slowly bring fans back uh, to football. It's not going to be like it was before, uh, where things are you know, packed stadiums and stuff. There's going to have to be protocols and that. But I, I think they are looking into it, but there's no confirmation yet. Okay. Well, man, I, it's going to be an interesting little journey the next six weeks, mate. You've been fit and firing, which uh, I'm pumped about. And we'll, we will touch on your journey um, with, obviously, Sutton and, and all that jazz a bit later. But let's start with an origin story now. Tell me, man, when you when you first started growing up playing sport, you grew up in Sydney. How did you become a goalkeeper? Was that? Did you always grow up and say to yourself, oh, "I'm going to be a bloody, I'm going to be the best goalkeeper in the world"? Like, what was what were you telling yourself as a six year old growing up? I was actually telling myself that I was going to be like Ronaldinho. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> trying to do his tricks in the backyard. Huh? Hey, funnily enough, back in the day before Rondinho got his teeth fixed, I had similar teeth to him, so I had to get my teeth fixed as well. But uh, yeah, I thought I had about myself, you know, playing in midfield, this and that. But yeah, anyway, <laughs> I loved him growing up. But look, I, I, I love the way he played the game. Always with a smile on his face, no fear. He played like he was with his mates in, you know, in the backyard, and I love that about him. And, and he had unbelievable qualities. So. I always followed him, uh, and I was an outfielder up until the age of 14. I never oh, yeah. thought I went to goals. Um, I always wanted to be an outfielder, rated myself, thought I could score goals, you know, 20, 30 a year. Oh, that's never... ass. Come on, how good were you? <laughs> hey, you got, <laughs> hey, you, buddy, you got good distribution at least. <laughs> You're good with your feet. And slowly, slowly, as the years went by, I uh, started to started to you know fill out become taller and it was one um one 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 game when i was uh, under 15s or 14s i can't remember exactly where the goalkeeper got injured and and i put my hand up and and, and went in because i was taller than everybody else and, and actually done really well and, and and loved it straight away it just took one really? moment, one game uh and i loved it and dad saw something, he, he felt something, and he asked, would you like to do goalkeeper sessions just to see, you know, what, what, what you think? And, you know, I was young, I was, I was, you know, was keen, I, I loved going and goal, and I, I just started from there. Wow. So you didn't start when you, you were younger. You just one day, a, a kid got injured, and you were like, stuff it. You didn't even do it beforehand. Absolutely nothing like that. I never owned a pair of gloves. I never went in goals, you know, obviously. Wow. Wow. We were kids, we would shoot against each other, but it was just, you know. No, it was just whatever. Yeah, it was just whatever. But and it, it, it just took one moment. I didn't think anything of it. I just went in because I was taller. Yeah, it just I went in and, and, and I really enjoyed it. Um, you know, I, I, yeah, I just, it just clicked wow. and I was just I didn't know that. right away. Yeah. Wow. And then, well, how did, then you got scouted by Liverpool. You got signed up and you, you spent, you spent a bit of your career there. How did that happen? Well, that's the thing. It, like everything happened so quick. You know, I was raw. I was tall. I had the physique, and then I, because I'd been playing on the field the uh, all my life before that, I I was good with my feet. So I had something different about me. And uh, it was well, uh, I think I was fifteen at the time, uh, and I played a full season um, in uh, in uh, New South Wales Premier League MPL there. Um, and there was a, um, a manager uh, called Manny Spanadakis, who was the under 20s coach. Uh, he liked me, and uh, the same thing, you know, a bit of luck, you know, um, 
the goalkeeper got injured and, and he, he said, look, I, I, I think you've got something. I'm going to put you in. So I was 15, 16 at the time, played a couple of games under 20s, got seen uh, by an agent who then said, I, I, I think you've got something to, to go overseas. And within a year um, or a year and a half, I think it was 18 months max, I had trials at Charlton first and then Liverpool. And within a year and a half of being in goals, I ended up signing at Liverpool. Wow, what was it? So, what was the what were the trials like when you were at Liverpool? How did it all happen? So, you flew over there. You had your you had your trials at, at Cheltenham and and Liverpool. How long did they go for? And what was it like just walking in? Well, the first week was at Charlton, so I um, I, I, I flew in, uh, settled for a couple of days, and then I had a had a trial at Charlton. Uh, it's it, both a week's trial. Uh, went to Charlton. You know, just was fearless, young kid, fearless, was buzzing to be there, um, you know, and, and trained and just gave it everything I had. Um, I wasn't expecting much, to be honest, because I, I was just so new and, and I was young and, you know, new to goalkeeping. But I just gave it everything. And uh, by the end of the week, uh, they had told my father and my agent that they wanted to offer me a contract. Uh, and they never told me, my mum, my, sorry, my father and my agent, they never told me. And they said, look, you know, you've done well at Charlton. They'll let you know what's going to happen. But they knew that Charlton was going to offer me a contract. And obviously, Liverpool got a, a wind of it. But they didn't tell me because they didn't want me to, to, to well, whatever, become complacent or put pressure on myself at Liverpool. So I went to Liverpool. Yeah. Trained at Liverpool after three days. They obviously knew that Charlton wanted to sign me and they offered me a contract. And once Liverpool offered me a contract, you know, it was you know, a dream come true. I still can't believe that, you know, the opportunity had happened to this day. And I ended up signing at Liverpool. Yeah, were you going for Liverpool at the time? I, I supported Liverpool, yeah. Um, you know, but being so young, you know, you just love football. They were my team in England until I went there and, and, and seen the fans, which we both experienced um, at the Champions League, you know. I just fell in love with the club. Yeah, the club's just it's, it's unreal. Yeah, and what was what was it like? Like you, man, you rub shoulders with some of the biggest players in the world. Um, Steven Gerrard, uh, Chubby Alonso, Pepe Reina was in goals um, at the time. Correct? Yes. Um, uh, you, there were some big players. Um, I can't remember who else at the time, but uh, there was. I'm sure if we if we bring it up and you're going to reel some names off, they're huge. Um, what was it like, like sharing a dressing room with them and just being in their presence and just being there? Like as much as like if anyone that's watching, I'm, there's, there's there's millions of supporters. Everyone wonders what is what, what what's it like behind the, behind the closed doors? Like what's it really like? Yeah, well, you know, I went there. I'd signed uh, originally in the reserve team, um, so I was training with the reserves. You know. You know, and and at Melwood so at the time, uh, there's the academy, uh, and then there's Melwood training ground. So I would uh, train with reserves, but play uh, for the under 18s at the time in the academy on the weekend. And uh, you know, so there was two different venues. And now they, they they're going to put it all into one at the academy in in, in in Liverpool. But at the time, it was you earn your right to get from the academy to the reserves. The reserves then. Uh, train on a different pitch to the first team and, and the whole concept is is that you see the first team there but you're not there you need to work hard to get there do you know what I mean so you see them yeah. you see what they do uh anyway so I, I couldn't believe it you know like players that you said like Gerard Alonso Torres Reina all these all these boys are, are 15 20 meters away from you on the opposite pitch and, and you're training and you're just doing what you're doing uh and then a year later um Rafa Benitez at the time called me into his office and said, look, I, I'm going to give you your first team number, uh, which was 43, and uh, you're going to move up to the first team dressing room. And I, I couldn't believe it. Um, I ended up sitting next to Martin Skirtle uh, and John Joe Shelby in, in, in the changing room. And uh, from there on, was training with the first team and playing in the reserves um, for six years it was. What was that like? Yeah, it was it was surreal. You know, at the time, but you know, you got to be honest. I was I couldn't believe it. Like you look up to these guys, and 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 you, you get nervous, and 
you don't want to speak because you don't, you know what I mean? It's just, it's just, it's surreal. Like, but then as time goes on, you realize that they're just like you and I, mate. They're just normal people who go about their business, you know, who are ultimate pros and, and they look after you. And once they put your arm around you and, and, and see that you're a young boy, if you're doing the right things and, and, and so forth, that they'll look after you and they, and they become friends. And uh, that's how it is about the start. Wait, wait, I, lo I, I lost you. Are you back? Yeah, we're yeah. back. Um, yeah, and going into – sorry, I lost you for like five seconds. Um, and just going into, obviously, Rafa Benitez. Now, he rated you extremely highly. He said you were the best goalkeeper for your age. How did that make you feel and how did that actually affect you? Because I remember it. I remember I was – I was young, like I was so young, and I remember reading that article. Like I remember, I was at Greek school, and it was in the Neil Scorsos, the Greek newspaper. Um, Rafa Benitez uh, has rated Australian goalkeeper Dean Vizanis, and like, how did that actually make you feel? And how did that affect you? Like, what did that do to you and your mentality? Did it help you? And that would have been a world of pressure on your back. And how I can't remember how old were you at the time when they. When they said that, like, how did that all make you feel? Yeah, look, I was 16 at the time, um, and yeah, it was it was unbelievable. Um, I couldn't believe that he said it. Um, but as you said, it, 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 it is massive pressure to, to to be called the best goalkeeper in the world for your age. Um, you know, it, it, I'm fortunate enough to to have had the career that I've had and have a fantastic career and. You know, but sometimes people always look back to that to that comment and they say, oh, they expect you to be the best goalkeeper in the world at 29 years of age, you know. So it has its pros and it has its cons. But for me, it's something that can never be taken away from me. Um, I was lucky enough to, to work under such a fantastic manager in Rafa and for him to value me at that time and for him to say that, it, it's something special and something that will live with me forever because... You know, it's like it doesn't come around every day. Um, so one thing I learned from that was that, yeah, okay, he did say that. Um, you just got to, at the time uh, when I was younger, maybe I, I held on to it too long. But, you know, as you grow older and, and you mature more, you just got to take it, um, you know, appreciate it, but continue to, 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 to try and strive like, everybody is, 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 is trying to do and, and get better every day and, and then your career will speak for itself you know what I mean did you do you feel like you like you kind of got a bit of high you got a bit high on your own supply or in an aspect or not really like what was that like what what kind of feel was it really no not not really I was um, you know at the end of the day you, you sign at Liverpool for a reason you know what I mean uh, because you're good enough and because they believe that, that, that you've got something special and, and a good talent. Um, and for, yeah. for Rafa to say that um, meant that he actually truly believed that, that, I, that I was a, a good goalkeeper and I had a chance to do something in the game. So for me, it was more like believing in myself to, to carve out a career because a lot of footballers and a lot of professional athletes, it's very difficult to have a career of 10 years, 15 years. You know, so many athletes drop out. Um, yeah. For whatever reason it might be, through injury, through you know, it, it, there's a million and one reasons. But you know, to carve out a career and and to and to use that and to use it as um, you know, to focus and to be better is what I try to do. Well, then, how about if you look at the team that you were with, um, the academy team at Liverpool? How many of those players actually went into went into the Premier League um, that you were with? Like, it's. Yeah. The numbers, I uh, wouldn't probably wouldn't be big. I think we were together at the time when the article came out. Uh, so in the FA Youth Cup final that we played against Arsenal, uh, I think yes. from that That's squad, accurate. that squad that we had uh, when we played the FA Youth Cup final, there's only like three players that are still playing professionally uh, from our squad. So yeah, it just shows that it's it's very difficult to make it in this industry. I think there was a, wasn't there a stat in that article or something? I think it had to do with something with Raheem Sterling. I don't know where my head's going with this, but it was I think 
to make it into the Premier League. I remember we were talking about this on one of the drives in Europe. I think we were in Netherlands driving. You gave me a stat. If you, I don't know if you remember it. I can't remember it clearly. Like to actually make it as a professional footballer in the Premier League is like 99 or 98 points, something in comparison to all the kids that play the game. Um, do you remember it? Or it was a, tw- it was a yeah. tweet you were reading me. So from like all the, the thousands and hundreds of thousands of kids that the that, that, that academy players produce and stuff to actually make into the Premier League, it's less than 1%. I think it's like 0.8% yeah. and something like that, um, that that actually make it to, to the Premier League. Um, so... Yeah, look, if you think about it, there's what, say, 500 players in the Premier League in the world that can actually play in the Premier League. So, you know, you've got to be pretty, pretty special to, to, to be playing there. And Raheem, funny enough, he was my teammate and he's now one of the best players in the world. And ah, so there you he's a fantastic player. <laughs> <laughs> Man, it's, it's crazy the way it works, huh? Like, it's bloody nuts. But then from there, obviously... You you continued on your career. You went to Oldham? Yep. So I was at Liverpool for six years. And then uh, Oldham was saying, look, you're getting to an age now where you should be playing. Because I went on loan when I was 18 to Appleton Stanley and played, I think, 24, 25 games there. And it was first team football, played in some good games, like FA Cups against Fulham and stuff like that. And I think it was time for me to to then try and, and then play first team foot because I didn't want to stay at Liverpool for example stay another one or two years you know and 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 be a third choice goalkeeper and not have many games just to say that I'm a Liverpool player as such you know I, I felt that I needed to you know create my own destiny and, and do what I had to do so Oldham were chasing me and I ended up signing at, at Oldham at the end of my contract at Liverpool and how did how did you go there? I I, uh, I remember I think you you played ag- you played against Liverpool, uh, and you you were in goals. Yeah, so I was there for two years. The first year, uh, we we we, uh, we played. The second year, so it was like twelve months later. I just left Liverpool. All my mates there, still talking to them, still catching up with them and stuff like that. We actually drew Liverpool in the FA Cup. Uh, I think it was the fourth round of the FA Cup at Boundary Park, which is Oldham Stadium. It's a small stadium. It's, it's horrible to go there for a Liverpool player because they're used to, you know, boutique stadium, unbelievable stadium, 50 to 60 hours, cold Tuesday night in Oldham, freezing conditions, no, <laughs> probably turned off the hot water in the shower so they could have a cold shower. <laughs> it's horrible. That's no brilliant. <laughs> Uh, but it was full. There was 18,000 there. We ended up uh, winning the game 3-2. Uh, we ended up knocking them out, um, you know. And it was surreal for me because they're all my mates. Uh, it's a club that I love. But at the same time, you have a job to do. So, yeah, it was, it was a funny feeling. Going on that F, FA, Cup, F, uh, FA Cup run, I don't know. Is that the same thing that you got a hand on fucking Leighton Baines' fucking penalty? Was that, is that, is that just in the same year? That was the fourth round that we beat Liverpool. Then the fifth round, we, we drew Everton. Um, so the next round, we then play Everton back at uh, back at Oldham. We go 1-0 down. And uh, in the 95th minute, um, we equalise and go 1-1. And we, we earn a replay at Goodison Park. Uh, so a couple of weeks later, we then go to Goodison Park. And that was amazing, you know, to, 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 to be a, a Liverpool fan to try to go to Goodison Park and, and get a result, where there's 35,000, 40,000 people, full stadium. Um, and, yeah, Leighton Baines had a penalty and I had chocolate wrists uh, for that penalty because it hit my wrist and it felt like my wrist broke. And just, <laughs> the, 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 <laughs> hey, at least you got a bloody glove on it. Yeah, it is what it is. And, uh, <laughs> but it was a fantastic experience. And, and and then and then and then you moved on to uh, the great uh, the greatest place in the world, Greece. Yeah, fantastic place to <laughs> live. And uh, but at that time, uh, Greek football wasn't wasn't uh, doing so well. Let's just say that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that was bloody illustrious. You spent you spent. Uh, were you there? We a year, two years. How long were you there for? 
I signed a uh, I signed a three year deal there. Um, but obviously, look, you know, I it was still a, a, a time in my career that I look back on, and you know, I don't have any regrets. Um, but I look back on and, and you use it as a learning curve. You know what I mean? So I went to Greece, you know, being a Greek boy, um, but obviously Greece, we all know, is in financial difficulties. Um, and I went there and after three months, they stopped paying me, uh, which is, you know, it shouldn't be normal, but it does happen in the, in these countries. And, and uh, I had to leave. So after six months, uh, I left because obviously you've got bills, you've got you know, mortgages to pay and, uh, yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't, you know, stay there and not get paid. So I, I decided to leave after six months. Yeah, it's, it's a standard thing that unfortunately happens in the game. Yeah. Uh, um, and yeah. being in Greece, uh, yeah, I don't know. You probably had to wait. <laughs> I don't know. I wouldn't want to be. I want to know who you had to size up with because uh, <laughs> they definitely don't follow rules. But yeah, and then was that. Then did you come? Did you come back to Australia after that stint, or was there another club that you were yeah, at? So for? after that, I signed at Western Sydney Wanderers. Yeah, uh, to work with Tony Popper. Um, yeah, signed there, um, and that's where my career started with Western Sydney, where you know we did something special in our in our in our first year there uh, with the, with the club, um, and and played the second year there, and then. Yeah, it went on from there. Can you can you tell me what was it like? So the RBB when they first started, that was it mental. And then what you guys did, you went on that dream run in the Asian Champions League. Like, what was that? I remember just watching, like when you guys won that and you guys came back, um, and the fans were just, oh, that airport, like gives me goosebumps. Like, I got goosebumps thinking about it. Like, that was just it was peak A League. It was amazing. Just what was that whole Champions League run like, man? Yeah, it was incredible. It was unbelievable. So you know, I come back to to Western Sydney. Come back to 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 a coach that is for me one of the best in, in Australia. He's he's fantastic, and he, he gets a club up and running, uh, wins the, the 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 league in his first season to then qualify for Asian Champions League, and he brings together a, a team from Australia that, you know, has a salary cap of 3.5 million and the Chinese have salary cap, don't even have a salary cap and they pay players, you know, 12 million a season. Uh, so, you know, but, he, yeah, Popper always believes. He, he, he was very structured. He, uh, he has his methods, you know, he, he, he's uh, detailed in everything that he does. And we went on believing that we could beat anybody no matter how much they paid players no matter what they did um and he instilled that in us and you know slowly you, you win a quarter final you then go to a semi-final you then get a result there to then go to a grand final and win it in in the asian champions is actually two games it's not a one-off game it's a home and away leg so yeah anything can happen and, and uh yeah it, that, that club did something that I believe won't happen in Australian football for, for a very, very long time um, because it is, it's, it's, it's unbelievably difficult for Australian clubs at the moment to compete with Asia and the money that they're throwing about. They can't, we can't even get out of the groups. Like yeah. We're struggling to get out of the bloody groups. Um, where even in regards to... So I remember the first leg was here and then... we. What happened? Did we? Did you guys win? Was it one nil the first leg? I can't even remember um, yeah. the exact yeah. details. That Pertec, you know, uh, uh, Parramatta in Parramatta at home, packed stadium, RBB flying. You know, it, it was it was unbelievable time to, to be a Western Sydney uh, Western Sydney Wanderers player and fan. Um, you know, that's a massive club. Don't don't get it twisted. Western Sydney Wanderers is a huge club. Don't look at the results recently because they should be fighting for trophies every year. They are a fantastic club and a, and a massive club in Australia. Um, and we, we we play against Al Hilal, you know, a Saudi Arabian team who have got unlimited money, you know, um, top quality players. And no one, everyone wrote us off. No one dreamed that we could do what we did. And we ended up winning 1-0. I'll never forget. 
get it. Anthony Gold whipped in an unbelievable bomb. He put everybody's on the line to, to make sure he got into the cross and, and we ended up winning 1-0 and we took a 1-0 advantage to Saudi Arabia uh, two weeks later where we had to go to Saudi Arabia. And let me tell you, they made it tough. Um, you know, it's not like Australia. Sometimes in Europe and these countries, they do things that, you know, aren't seen as ethical or fair, but they will do anything they can because they want to win so badly. Um, so the way that we were treated, it was difficult. It was, uh, you know, some of the things that they did were, were horrible. You know, buses not turning up to trainings, um, being late for trainings, then not allowed to walk out on the streets at certain times at nights because we don't know who's, who's outside. Um, yeah, it, everything was against us and we ended up holding out for a nil or draw. Um, I'll never forget Ante Kovic having an unbelievable game and, you know, he, he was fantastic and instrumental to us winning the Asian Champions League and we ended up being crowned champions of Asia after that. And what was it? What was it like? Because what was it like being in that stadium, trying to 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 literally hold that one 0 lead? Like the fans, it would have just been sterile. Like it would have just been. Could you even well, hear each other? Like we got there, and uh, there was a it was a, a eighty thousand seater stadium, a huge stadium, and uh, we got there two hours before kickoff, and like this is no exaggeration, no lie. There was a hundred thousand men because in Saudi Arabia we all know that women aren't allowed to and stuff mm. like that, which has changed now. Uh, at the time, it was a hundred thousand men. Like I'm talking, they were sitting on the roof. There was every single um, walkway to go to the toilets was full. Like it was just crammed in. They were there four hours before kickoff. A hundred thousand people in the stadium waiting four hours before kickoff, and as you do. You walk out to, the, to see the ground, to look at the pitch before the game, an hour and 45 before, whatever it is, and the whistles and the jeers and the boos that, that ran through that stadium, it was surreal, Christian. Like, you could not hear yourself think. It was so loud. Um, but what an experience, man. What an experience that was. It would have been mad because even when you guys won, like, it's uh, drinking's illegal there. Um, yeah. So was like what was the celebration like yeah like we we were on cloud like we couldn't believe it like yeah we were in Saudi Arabia you know you want to celebrate you want to have a drink with the lads so we the only place we could go to is the Australian embassy so we we ended up going to the Australian embassy but the rules are so strict which we had to, we had to abide to all, all the coaching staff and everyone went to the Australian embassy to celebrate with the the Australians there and we had one drink. We could only have one drink um, because, you know, at the end of the day, you're in Saudi Arabia. You need to to, to respect what they're about. Um, so we had a glass of wine each. You know, the the, the boss spoke um, and he, he, he said to us, look, you, you will get your chance to celebrate um, at the right time when you get back to Australia. Um, and once we got back to Australia, we ended up celebrating all together as a team and with our families, which was perfect. Um, and then, yeah, in football, things you know happen very quickly. You celebrate, and then you back to work straight away because you got a game. It's like um, in when Cristiano seven Ronaldo, days. He, when he won the um, when he won the Champions League in two thousand and eight, the whole team was partying. He went straight back into the gym, and he started. Uh, yeah, he started going. Oh. So that's that's mental. That's yeah. always stuck with me. Like like this guy was just fuck the Champions League. He he wanted to be number one. Um, so that's. That's just insane. But, man, I remember watching the video and I've touched on it before. Like, what was it like? You walk open. So you, you walk, come into international arrivals. The doors have opened up. The whole Western Sydney team has walked out. And the fucking, the airport, <laughs> the airport's like the kings have turned up. Like. <laughs> Honestly, you would have thought Ronaldo, Messi, Suarez, Torres, Everyone has turned up. Like it was. <laughs> that's the, that's the, what I'm saying about, about this club. It, it, it's a big club. It's a special. Yeah, you know, we had to get escorted. You know, uh, around the back. This and that. There was thousands and thousands of 
RB, of the RBB in like it was packed. It was like sardines in the airport, Christian. Like I'm telling you, like players going inside. Oh no, there was a few players outside, but inside, no, uh. was, we were in trouble. But there was singing, there were drums, there was, and and that's what it's about. You know, that, that that's what I think football is about: passion, you know, love for your club, and and supporting a club. That you know what I mean. And I think that's gone away a little bit in, in Australian football. But, you know, there, there was no trouble. The RBB were, were fantastically behaved. They just supported their team. They just sung for their team. You know, there was thousands in the airport, so they probably closed the airport down. But it's a once-in-a-lifetime thing that they're going to probably see. And they wanted to support and show support for their players and, and their club, and that's what they did. And it was surreal. It was unbelievable. Yeah, it's insane that it's disappeared and it's only been four four years um we'll touch on we'll touch on that a bit yeah we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit down the track but um we'll, we'll continue because uh, i really want to speak to you about that that's a big topic that um that i do want to touch on but going into you know obviously so you continue on with your origin origin story so you left the wanderers and i remember I remember I was at an open for inspection. I was at the time I was probably the biggest Melbourne City fan that there ever was. I knew everything, and straight away Dean Buzana signs for Melbourne City. I was like, "Ooh, okay, here we go, here we go." Dean's in the building, and I actually I probably only I met you a couple months later. <laughs> at the club rooms, yeah, you saw Harry Menaras. <laughs> Jacket. I remember Harry. Oh. Harry, you're like nice jacket today. Yeah. <laughs> Harry, big Harry, Harry was in love. He's still wearing his Greek last jacket that we won. <laughs> He's still wearing it, <laughs> sniffing oh. it, touching it where you touched it. <laughs> the guy will never live that down. He, he, even when he's six, five years old, and it's like being fifty odd years before, he will still say, "Do you remember?" You cut, hey Dean. I'm losing you. Wait, Dean. Yeah, he he was just like. Oh, back. Can you hear me? Uh, I'm losing you. I'm back. Oh. I'm off. Come. Me. Nah, you're cutting out. Better. Dean? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, it's better. Sorry, I yeah. was losing you. Yeah, sorry, we lost you. So where was Harry living at? What was he not living down? No, I was saying like, even when he's like 65 years old and he'll, he'll be like, oh, do you remember when Greece won the Euros 55 years ago and Cuddy Stair scored that header? It was amazing. He'll be like retired village with his freak LS jacket on. Just talk to everybody. Harry's still sharing those bloody Euro 2004 videos. Celebrating in his jacket. I oh, know, like still, still talking about it. Like, all right, man. <laughs> no, love Greece, on it, but oh, oh my god, you're the best. You're the bloody best. Well, it's funny. You, uh, well, I remember after after you commented on his great jacket. I remember walking out and we we're crossing the bridge, and he's like, "Oh, I gotta add Dean on Facebook, man. I, I gotta add him. I, I, I gotta add him." And then became his. Then he became his great love affair of you. And it's. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad yeah. it happened. I'm glad it happened because it's. Uh, yeah, he you got him excited. You gave him some excitement in his life, and you know we we got to share a Champions League together, which we'll touch <laughs> on. But um, yeah, so obviously heading to Melbourne City, you you were there for four years. Um, yeah, you had four a great little. Yeah. You had a great stint. You won an FA Cup with uh, Tim Cahill. Your team that that year, that team was insane. Um, I remember, I remember that match against Melbourne Victory. That was probably the best performance I've ever watched for an Australian team. Like I remember, I was in awe um, watching that at the at the time. Like, and I don't think there's been a better performance since from a club. I've I've probably fallen off the A League. The last couple of years, but I just still don't believe there's been a performance like that. And that team was insane. And 
you know, you guys are going close. Now, this year, they're, they're going close. I saw they finished second um, in which they'll probably go on and, um, you know, fingers crossed, they should bring it home. But, yeah, what was it What was it like, your, your four-year stint? Yeah, well, um, I ended up getting signed from Melbourne City because I played, I think, two games for the Wanderers against City and, and they liked what, what they saw and ended up going to City. And, you know, City... Some of the best uh, uh, time of my career, you know, like the club is fantastic, um, it's professional. Uh, they, like I said, touched on earlier, that they, they do everything they can to ensure that you are the, the best athlete and person that you can be. Uh, so to spend four and a half years at such a fantastic club, I'll always remember it. And to, to bring the first trophy to the club for the men um, was was fantastic. You know, we had a fantastic team, you know, big players, um, and, and, and we, we we done something special there um, where we, we won we won their first FA Cup. And, you know, I was a part of the season two where I played uh, 15 games this season. And it's unfortunate with what's happened with the coronavirus where I've had to leave towards the end, which, you know, is a bit unfortunate. But, you know, I hope the club... You know, pushes on and, and, and wins another uh, another title because you know it would be fantastic to be a part of another team uh, and help another team to, to to win another title through this year as well. So, you know, it's it, it's a club that that deserves to be at the top because they do everything properly. Do they? They should. They, what are your predictions? They should win the title. I, I think they will. I think because yeah. you know we, we we've done we've worked hard through coronavirus. Players have kept fit. Uh, Eric Mombarts is, is, is a fantastic coach uh, and, and more importantly, a good person uh, who, who, who does everything um, perfectly. He, he, like I said before, Popo is structured. He's got a style of play. He's respectful. And I think they've got everything right. There's no guarantees in football, but I believe that if they perform, they will win the, the, uh, the, the, the grand final. I really do. How how do you how do you compare the facilities from Australian football to European football? Like I remember, I've seen Melbourne City's is insane. Um, I've seen Sydney FC's, which isn't that great, man. Yeah. For what that, I remember rocking up and looking in. I'm like, is this? They and I think they'd won two or two three yeah. titles at the time, and I'm looking in like, are they training here? Like it's mental. But how do you compare the facilities overall? Um, you know, or let's just say Melbourne cities compared to Europe, and yeah, just the just the different standards. Well, I think uh, in terms of the A League, I think Melbourne City and now Western Sydney Wanderers are, are, are leaps and bounds ahead of everybody else. Their facilities are second to none and world class. Uh, Melbourne City's facility is is, is ridiculous. Um, it's it's on par with Premier League clubs. Um, it's got a fantastic oh, wow. pitch. It's got an unbelievable gym. It's got cafeteria. It's got a chef. It's got a massive changing room. It's it is done properly, and it is it is perfect for for, for a footballer to go in and, and, and be able to work there every day. Um, and that's where the A League should be. The A League should have, in my opinion, every club should strive to to have something similar. Dean, you're cutting out again. Do that. Hello. Yeah, you're back. Can you hear me? Oh. Can you hear me? Yeah, you keep cutting out. I don't know why. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Um, yeah. So, what were you saying? Uh, what was I saying about the facilities? I was saying, um, yeah, like Melbourne City. Um, their facility with, with Premier League club is it, ridiculous. It's unbelievable how good the facilities are. Um, with this and Sydney Warriors, Sydney Warriors has invested heavily in a fantastic facility, um, and, and, and they are top quality. Um, and that's where I think that the, the rest of the league should be too. You don't have to have the best. But you should have a facility that that is perfect. And uh, Chris, again, you're cu you're cutting out. You're in and out. 
Hang on. Yeah. Should I try and turn the Wi-Fi on? Yeah, try and turn the Wi-Fi on, see what happens. Yeah, see what happens. Is it better? Yeah. Yeah, I think you're better. Um, how, how, how am I? Do I keep cutting out? Or... Christian. Yo, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I think you're better I think now. Just, I think it's just kicked in. Sorry, man. I don't know what's going on. Nah, that's all right. That's all right. Um, yeah, so if you were... If you were a kid again trying to make it, what what would you do differently or would you just do everything the same? Is there any tips like for any young kids that are trying to make it? Yeah, look, I think um, as a kid coming through, you've got you to play with a smile on your face and you've always got to enjoy the game. I think that's the most important thing because when you're enjoying something, when you love something that you do, you will go to the next level in terms of, you know, your, your work ethic and stuff like that because that, that for me is the most important. You might have a talent, but if you don't have the love for the game or the love for what you do and you don't have that work ethic, you won't get to the, uh, to the standard that, that you want to be at. Uh, so for young kids, it's all about, you know, doing the extra hours, um, you know, working hard and, and striving to be better than, than you were the day before because, you know, that, that's how you get to a certain level and that's how you carve out a career. Um, that's most important. Um, you know, for me, I've had a lot of setbacks in my career. Yeah, I've had a, 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 a good career. I've, I've won some titles and stuff like that. But there's been a lot of setbacks too. And I think what 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 helped me was at difficult times throughout my career, I got through it because you know life's not rosy, rosy. You're not going to you know have every day where you feel 100 percent or things are going for 100 percent. So it's important that you. Take it on the chin and, and, and keep moving forward. How how did you deal always being in the in the spotlight? Um, you know, always with the criticism of Dean Muzanas didn't have the greatest of games, and then you're getting slandered online. Um, how did you deal with that as a footballer? Because it's not it's not easy. Like you're always in the public eye, or you know, there's always an article about you and. There's always something. There's always someone that's going to say something about what you're doing and, you know, nothing's ever perfect for everybody. And that's just obviously part of the game. But how did you how did you find it? And did it, did it get to you at times and, um, you know, over time? Like, yeah, just how have you found it? Yeah, like, I totally agree, mate. Like, I think it's difficult, man. It's, it's not nice, you know. But as you grow older, because when I was younger, you know, you tend to read into things and it affects you and it hurts you. But as you grow older, you just realize that it will never be stopped. You know, there will always be people out there. I call it tall, tall poppy syndrome that want to chop you down. And and that's just how it is. That's just life. So you just got to be happy with what you're doing and the way that you're living your life and, and the way that you, what you're doing, you know, you're striving to be better. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you can't, you can't stop that online bullying and, and stuff like that. Because, you know, you, you, you look at Barcelona, they have one poor result the other night and, you know, everyone's slating Messi, everyone's talking about PK's too old, Vidal's not good enough. We're talking about the best players in the world, man. Like, like yeah. come on. They, they, they played one terrible game. Yeah, all right, what? So now all of a sudden they're, 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 they're too old and you need to sell them straight away. Yeah, it's a like, disaster. It's just, what do they, they say? It's a disaster season or... It's a, yeah, it's a disaster. Messi needs yeah. to leave Barcelona. <laughs> but the week before when Messi scored a hat-trick and uh, got 15 assists, oh, he was uh, he's the best on the earth. He's so good. Yeah. And one week later, he needs to leave the club. <laughs> yeah. That's how it is, mate. Yeah, it always, it always makes me laugh. Like, one week's just absolute doom and gloom. And then the next week, it's just that everyone's back in, everyone's back up in arms, and they're your know, title favourites, and blah blah blah. I think it's just yeah. it's all just part of the game, and you know the the supporters obviously they they can be extremely passionate, um, which it adds it adds some it adds some flavour. And I remember there just being my first. Uh, I won't actually I won't touch on it yet. We'll wait. We'll wait. I'll, I'll ask you a few right, things, okay, okay. and then we'll get to the Champions League, but. Playing some, playing across some fairly big clubs, you know, what did you notice? Like, what was the underlying trait that they all share? What different differentiates the best clubs 
with the worst clubs that aren't, well, not the worst, but the successful ones with the not yeah. as successful clubs? Well, I think uh, for me, it's all about the one percenters, mate. I think if you do everything like the one percent, the smallest thing that you might think does not count, I think the top clubs in the world do that. Like, for example, now Jurgen Klopp has 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 come into a, into Liverpool and he's he's turned the club into probably right now the best club in the world because Easy. he's so detailed in everything that he does. Like even for us, like I oh, go back to Tony Popovich. He was so big on everything, like every little detail being perfect. For example, when you go to an airport, everyone dresses the same. Everyone looks professional. You know, you, you're upholding an image, you know. Um, you know. If there's a gym session to be done, you do your gym session to 100%. You know, if you're on the pitch for an hour and a half, you give 100, uh, one hour and a half of 100% intensity. And it's just all those little things that, that, that then make up the 100%. I feel sometimes clubs take shortcuts and it, and, and, it, and it affects them later on. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. That's... Yeah. It's, it might be a little thing like, okay, uh, everybody wears the same track suit uh, to the, to the, to the uh, airport and the same shoes. So when you walk through the airport, you look like Melbourne City, a professional outfit or Western Sydney Wanderers or whoever it is, Liverpool Football Club. And there's an aura about you. There's a, you know, you look professional and, and you uphold the club that you're playing for with respect and professionalism. Yeah. And as you said, like all those one percenters, they add up, they make a huge difference. They separate. 100%. Yeah. They, they, they separate it literally the top from, from the bottom. Um, exactly. do, you think, do you think Australia is close to catching up to Europe in terms of quality and, um, in regards to the, the, the actual playing style, the players coming through? Are we close? Look, I think Australia, for me, has a, has a, has a lot of talent and a lot of um, room to, to to become something special. I think we've plateaued a bit the last couple of years, uh, the league, um, because we were going you know through a fantastic phase where West Sydney Wanderers were winning things, where Sydney FCs come through and they they've become a strong outfit. Crowds are at twenty twenty five thousand. You know, Melbourne Victory is always a massive club fighting for things. You know, uh, we had top players coming like Del Piero's uh, and, and stuff like that. And there was traction behind the league. People wanted to go watch the league. People wanted to. I think we've fallen away from that a bit. I think it's important to attract high profile marquees. I think Diamante, for example, has been superb for Western United. Uh, Good. You know, he's come, he's got a, he's got a great character. Um, mm. He's energetic, you know. He, he he's a great footballer and a good person. And I think that's that will, will lead us on our way to to have a strong competitive league, um, you know, and, and become successful. Because Australia, you know, we, we, we do produce good talent. You know, we we've had some some big players. You have the Dukas, Kills, Kales, Schwartz. You know, you know, it's, it's we we can do it. And and uh, I think that's that's the most important thing. Yeah. And, uh... Where do you think the A-League can improve? Like, what do you think it's missing? For me, like, the biggest one that probably stands out is is the fans. Um, yeah. Like, that is there. And that's where we can, t- now I can, we can touch on the Champions League. But apart from that, like, what else, where, what else is missing? Yeah, look, you, you see now, like, football without fans, it's, it's not the same. Um, you know, it, they are probably up there with some of the most important part of football uh, because, you know, they drive your club. Uh, they drive uh, attention to the game, uh, atmosphere, everything. So I think that's it's very important. I think to, in order to get uh, fans to come to the game, it then goes down to the quality on the pitch. Um, and you need uh, people in Australia because, let's face it, this, uh, football at the moment is not the top priority in Australia. You've got your AFL, you've got your rugby league. Um, so we need to be different to the others and, 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 and have an attraction for people to come and watch our game. So for me, high-profile marquees is important. And if you don't spend the money on a high-profile marquee, well, you're not going to get people to come to the game. Um, so for me, that that's the most important thing is, is the investment in these players 
so people can come and watch uh, because that's what the MLS did. The MLS went and got Gerard, Zlatan Ibrahimovic, uh, all these massive players, and that's really taken off to another level. Well, their first their first big one was David Beckham, and then it just oh there you it, go yeah Beckham too. yeah Bobby and King. It, yeah and then it just spiraled from there. And then they they're signing players like that Carlos Vela. He's been an absolute gun there. Um, there's 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 heaps of them. I, off the top of my head, I can. There was a uh, uh, Keane. Um, they've had some big names. Yeah, Matuidi's gone there now. Matuidi's gone there now. Yeah, they've tomorrow. had some. Like now, it's just blowing up. And I remember, I remember when I was when I, I call myself probably one of the biggest A League fans. I knew every player, I knew everything. We were on par. Like it was A League and MLS yeah. on par. And it's just like oh, it's embarrassing. Yeah. How badly we've been surpassed, and you know, a th- big thing for me was I've, I've obviously I've been a massive football fan in Australia, and I've obviously followed AFL as well. And you know, going over to the Champions League with you last year, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a Tottenham fan, you're a Liverpool fan, you're at Pex Valley in Netherlands at the time, and I remember putting it on on uh, Instagram. I'm like, you know what? I'm going, I'm going to the Champions League, and you're like, yeah. you're like what? Do you want to go? I'm like, done. You organised yeah. the tickets. I I came to the Netherlands, um, and we spent we spent a bit. We spent I think fourteen days in Europe together, and we went to Spain. And what I actually witnessed there is cool, wasn't it? Was it Mate. was it was it was my first taste of. European football, and it was it, it was it was amazing. You it was, pumps, eh? Oh man, like, <laughs> like I I can't even believe. I remember coming back a couple months later. We went to the AFL Grand Final together, <laughs> and we're just looking at each other like, "What is this compared to what we went to?" Um, the fans were unreal. For days, it was three days. We got there yeah. two days prior. Yeah, two days prior, and the streets of Madrid were were, were flooded with red. Uh, you know, obviously Liverpool fans, um, probably some of the biggest fans in the world, just walking through the streets. Everything was red. Uh, people congregating, enjoying themselves, singing songs. It was just, yeah, you never see that in Australia, man. It's just, it's I've just different level. No, nah, it completely changed. It completely changed everything. How I felt about like Australian football um, and and AFL, like AFL, it just never felt the same to even support it. And Australian football just felt sick. I really felt sick. Like just how you know uh, how I feel like what's happened to the game over the last couple of years. How the crowds have just disappeared. And yeah, it's. I, I, I really, really hope that the game can can get to something like that. Like, just just for people that are listening, like, I remember walking through the streets of Madrid and I, do you remember, Dean, there was that, that, that sick Liverpool fan that had me up. <laughs> like, spitting in my face. What, <laughs> what was he saying to you? You got to be a Liverpool fan. <laughs> <laughs> this guy literally was scaring the absolute life out of me. But it was passion, man. It was it was passion. Like everyone was seeing in the streets. It was. Uh, I remember just remember walking. We got out of the taxi to. And it was game day. We got out of the taxi to walk to the stadium. I felt like I felt like we were European prisoners lining yeah. up. To try and get through, we we're sweating. Do you remember that? It yeah, was, we finally the line. The line was insane. We finally got in. Well, like it we took finally us an hour and a half to get in. Yeah, we no, we got through like the checkpoints to get up to the stadium. <laughs> and then we get up to the stadium. There's there's Spanish police like arresting people left, right, and center. We were holding our tickets like it was Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. We got the gold. It was. <laughs> We're hiding them. <laughs> and I remember, do you remember before we actually got into the stadium, we put our backs onto the wall just to kind of watch what was going yeah. on. And he, uh, police were just arresting people, trying to steal tickets. It was just chaos. Mate, it mate. Was because they like would do anything they experience in my life. 
Like, they just do anything they can to support their teammate. You know, it, it, it's 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 just a, a passion that you know it's 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 their be all and end all, mate. Like for their club to win their Champions League, it is like everything to them, mate. It's it's ridiculous. I remember walking up to our seat, and we had those two old fellas there, and and they were in our seat. And they're like, oh, we don't know where our seat is. Do you mind if we sit with you? We're Liverpool. We're a family. And we're like, yeah, man, no problem. Like, join us. So we didn't even sit down for, felt like four days. But it was like, it was 90 minutes plus the celebration. But we were just standing up. Everyone was singing. Everyone was together. Yeah, it was it was unbelievable, man. I remember, I still remember, like, I actually watched the video a couple months ago because it was, it was the anniversary. So I posted up. And I remember, like, walking up the stairs and i was on record oh i was on record walking up the stairs and i remember my first moment of like i'm getting goosebumps thinking about it my first moment of actually looking at the stadium and i in the video i'm like oh my god like, <laughs> i couldn't believe it i was in tears i was i was like looking at you i was like oh my god like we're here like we actually made it and it was it was unreal it was it was it was something that you can't even explain. Like it was, it was one just of the best experiences I've had in my life. A hundred percent, man. Like definitely, you are your euphoric moments. Like, and that's just it. Pains me that this needs to come to the Australian game. It needs to. It does, because you look at things that Australia have done, and yeah, you know, when when Johnny Aloisi scores that penalty to send Australia to the World Cup, and you know, Stadium Australia's got ninety thousand people that are supporting our nation. You know, we can do it as a country. You know, we are a successful country in terms of sport. You know, we are known for our sport and everything that we do. We are competitive, and and, and we do everything we can to represent our sport fantastically. So Australia, for me, has such potential to become fantastic in terms of a league, and I really hope it does because. It's enjoyable to play in the A League, and and, and 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 it's you know that there's a lot of potential there. Um, so yeah, you just can't you can't explain like that feeling that you that we got at, at the Champions League. You just really hope that it comes to Australia because it would be phenomenal. Yeah, well that it's 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 a feeling I can't describe, and it's it's nothing. It pretty much just turned me off the Australian AFL. Like I can't support it because of. What you know, as I said, a couple months later, we go to an AFL grand final, and it's actually it's funny, it's so funny. I remember in 2017, in 2017, it was you remember this time we we, we were going, um, it was me, you, Harry, and I met Tim Cale for the first time, and that oh, the, yeah. night, the night, the night. Uh, the day after, so the day after was the AFL grand final, and I remember Tim Cahill. He said he said that he went to the AFL grand final the year after, and it was the biggest. And when waste the Bulldogs of time. won, yeah, yeah, the Bulldogs won, and he said yeah. it was the biggest waste of time that he'd ever gone to, and it was just a nothing. It was lifeless. And then I went to the twenty seven grand final. Uh, Richmond won. I was like, oh my god, like this is amazing. This is ridiculous, like, yeah, this is great. You know what I mean? And then like. You go to the Champions League and then you go to the Richmond 2019 grand final and I'm just looking at you like, man, like, <laughs> fucking time. <laughs> Waste of time. Now, like, <laughs> like, now I get yeah. it. And you can't even describe, like, like, and that's why even people listening to this, like, you just, like, it's it's hard to, it's hard to understand where we're coming from. But when you go there, it will happen. And I it's pray one day. It, the, yeah. it comes to the game, and you know it's 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 what it's missing. And you know, I, <laughs> I can talk about this topic for for ages, man. But it's insane, man. Where, like, what's the current state of the A League? What is the future of Australian football? Does it need a second division? Like, what does it need to resurrect? Because, as I said, I was the biggest, one of the biggest Australian football fans, and I I stopped even coming to watch you, Dean. I was like, man, I can't do yeah. this. This is just this is just pain and like what's it gonna take for everybody to come back? I think um, James Johnson coming in um, is being very positive. I think he is is, is fantastic in what he's doing. You know, you look like for myself uh, being with Steph, uh, the work that he did to get the Women's World Cup to Australia. I think that is 
amazing and massive for Australian football. Uh, I think the women will do us proud. And I yeah. think that is that is a opportunity for Australian football to really capitalise on and use this to help the women's game and to help the men's game and drive our game forward. Um, I think... Huge. Yeah, it's it's huge. I say, if we do it right, and 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 we, you know, because James Johnson does know what he's talking about. He, he is fantastic. I'm sure he will do it right. And I said, if we do, I, he can really help Australian football in general. Um, and another thing as well, which which you talk, uh, touched on, and I know Diamante did recently too, it, it, it is relegation, promotion, and relegation. That give something different to the league. You know, I've, I've signed now back in England where before I was at Oldham and you're playing for something every week. You don't want to get relegated. You want to climb the ladder. You're looking at the ladder thinking, if we get three points here, we're out of relegation. Or if we get three points here, we're, we're going to be in the playoffs. We could get promoted to, the, to, to, to League One or Championship or Premier League. And, 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 and you, because at the end of the day, Central Coast Mariners, at the last five years, they've come the last four times, and there's no, there's no punishment. Yeah, yeah, you know I mean, like there's no, you know, it, it drives not- clubs from the second, yeah, it drives clubs from the second division to be better, to improve, to get to the A League, to do you know what I mean, to, to to strive to be one of the best clubs in the A League, and then it drives the clubs in the A League. Oh shit! We don't want to go down. We need to be better. We need to do this. We need to do that. So I think it's it's very important as well. Yeah, there's no. There's no str- there's no sweat from the fans yeah. abusing them. There's no media pressure. Um, like I was actually watching. Uh, have you seen it on Netflix the Sunderland Till I Die? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, that that's that. terrible, man. That's like, yeah. like, that's like, that's what we need. Yeah, exactly. Well, that, that's what I'm saying. Sunderland is a massive club. It's been the prem, and they have dropped down. I think what's League One now, and they are. Yeah. Like it's like it's the end of the world. Like they they've made a few decisions financially, uh, and business decisions that that have impacted the club. But you know, they need to be back to the top, and they are fighting to get back to the top because they're a huge club. Huge club, man. Huge yeah. club, and like even going back to you know just the Australian game. Like I've seen this like clubs like for example Heidelberg United. Like they're doing a massive. Like I haven't, I haven't, I've just seen what they posted on their Facebook page. I don't know if you've seen it, but they're pouring a lot of money into yeah, the, the redevelopment and, and everything. Like I'm sure they're fighting for to 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 well not for but getting ready for the second division if if it is the case. And I I, I think we need it. We need it. We need it. We need. It. I was a, at the start. You know, I was I I wasn't big on bringing back you know, uh, the ethnic clubs and all that jazz. And I just think that there just needs, I think there needs a bit of flavour. How do you feel? Obviously not not coming in there and, you know, South Melbourne Hellas and throwing in, you know, all the all the ethnicity. We're in Australia, but, you know, and obviously not. We don't want uh, South Melbourne versus Preston rights. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again, but I think we just need some life. Like what, uh, are you, do you I feel agree. this way? I think I think it's important to, to 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 keep that culture. I think you know the Greek clubs and the Croatian clubs. I think they're massive in Australian football. I think that that gives you an identity and 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 and, and you know cultures to support their their clubs. For example, the Greeks at South Melbourne and the Croatians at uh, at, uh, yeah. at um, Melbourne Knights. Um, it, but it's got to be done respectfully and it's got to be done correctly. You know, you can't just Use that as an excuse to 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 add hooliganism and, and yeah, stuff like that. Because yeah, okay, around world football that does happen, but it, it's not good, man. Yeah, you know I mean, it's not good. What we experienced in in, in Madrid was sixty thousand uh, people you know, loving their team, supporting their team. Yeah, okay, there's going to be the couple that that always ruin it for everyone. Yeah, but you can't stop that. But as long as the majority support their team you know for example us greeks we support south melbourne because we love south melbourne because we're greek and we do it respectfully and right and we sing for our club then it adds value to australian football no doubt i'm a true believer in that 
because it gives clubs identities. You know what I mean? Like something to support, something to hold on to. I don't I, even, but even when we were in Madrid, like there was nothing scary. Like I don't think I didn't see. I don't, I don't remember. Did we see anything apart from being up at the stadium? People were trying to steal tickets. <laughs> apart from yeah. that, no, no one fighting. I I can't remember. No, no, no. There was definitely like even like two. You, like two, we, we were skeptical. Like we didn't know what to expect. But yeah. two English clubs, Tottenham, Liverpool, you know, rich history between them. Yeah, you know, that, 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 I didn't see any fights. I didn't see any 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 trouble. Okay, yeah, you had the old people like you know you worried about your ticket. Maybe it was just us being paranoid. But yeah. you know, <laughs> you know, like you know, that was something so minor. But you know, there was no like fights or riots or anything like that. They supported their team. They sang their team. They bantered each other to and from, and that was it. Yeah, it was. Um, no, it was pretty good, man. I, and that's why I hope we can, you know, we can we can bring that up. I completely forgot that. Um, Australia and New Zealand won the Women's World Cup, and that yeah. was amazing marketing. You pointed that out to me. I completely forgot. Yeah. Like the marketing was insane because even even me, I've been as I said, I've been out of the game now for a couple of years from literally knowing everything. I've dropped off the face of the earth, but I saw that. I saw the reaction. Oh, well, how did you miss it, really? But like, the, it was amazing. Just the whole the what as one hashtag off the as one. Yeah, as one, like it was an insane campaign. So I think, you know what, like that was a very smart move. I, yeah, I completely forgot to touch on that. Very smart move, man. Yeah. So I think hopefully, fingers crossed, you know, the game is it's going to, well, it's we're going to be in a very good place. We've we've obviously won the Men's World Cup and now we've got the Women's World Cup, which is insane because obviously we went to the Women's World Cup as yeah. well last year to watch Steph. Um, and, and the Matildas, and that was that was that surprised me how good the Matildas are, like how good they actually are. And it's it's insane, it's an insane level. I only watched one match, I wish I stayed for longer. If I um, if I knew how good it was going to be, I would have done the whole group stage with you, but yeah, uh, yeah. So I think there's a lot of upside in the game, we've just got to make sure that the right people are in the game. and Oh, well, fingers crossed it's yeah. all worked out. I agree, man, because, yeah, it's – it's the women, uh, you know, they're in a good place. They're, they're, they're doing well. You know, you look at – I think it's 95% of the women's national team right now are in Europe. Yes. Uh, of our Australians are playing in Europe, uh, not just for any – for big yeah. clubs. Sam's at Chelsea, Caitlin and Steph are at Arsenal, Alana's going to Tottenham. You know, West Ham's got Emily Van Egmont and and Mackenzie. Yeah, you know, they're everywhere and they're doing well and they're driving the game. So that's what I'm saying. Like, if we can use that and and and, and support them and and get behind them, it, it can just help everybody. And even on even on the men's, like the women are smashing it and and they're holding the game right now. They are actually holding the game in Australia for us at the moment. Like they're driving it, which is incredible. So on the on the on the men's end, um, which which players who do you feel is coming out at the moment? Azani's in, in Netherlands. That's been yeah. a good thing there. That's who, a great move for him. Which other men are, are coming through the ranks at the moment? Well, you've got like Azani, who hopefully now he's recovered from his knee. He's looking strong, yeah. looking good. Can 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 drive that for the young boys. But you got like obviously Moisey and Matty Ryan doing really That's well right. in the prem. They're driving it at the Socceroos. But even for myself, like someone like Jamie McLaren, who has scored another 20 goals in 22 yeah. games in the A-League, you know, he he's he's doing fantastically well as well. So he could, he's driving the game in Australian football for, for Aussies at a national level because he's played 22 games. He's scored 20 games. I think he became the first player to score 20 goals in three consecutive seasons, um, something like that. Um, so, you know, that, like we said before, Australia has talent, um, you know, but if things are done properly, you know, we, we can excel. Yeah. Um, well, I think, Dino, we've had, an, we've had an amazing conversation. I think I'll wrap it up with one last question. Um, you're 29 years old. We, I reckon you, you still got 10 in, yeah? You still got yeah. 10 in, yeah? But um, after football finishes, have you thought about what you're going to be doing next and... Um, yeah, like obviously you want to you want to play the game uh, at the highest level for as long as possible. But uh, it, there's always going to be a time where it's going to end, and 
you know, that next stage of, of the fo- of a footballer's life is um, it's it's hard. I well, from what from what from what I read in here, it's very hard for people to adjust to get back into the real world yeah. and and all that jazz. Have you thought about it? Yeah, definitely. You're spot on, mate. Um, it's it's a very difficult transition for a lot of footballers um, because you know you got to accept that you know you might not be earning the same money as you were before. You know, you're back into the real world. You got to work. You know, you, know, you got to work hard and, and stuff like that. For myself, yeah, I have been thinking about it. Um, I would like to go into a coaching aspect of some sort, um, yeah. whether that be at a professional environment or something to do with kids. But if that wasn't to work out, um, you know, real estate, and not just saying it because, you know, you're a good mate of mine, but my, my brother's in it. Um, I've invested in real estate, uh, stuff like that. So there's a dead uh, player. <laughs> yeah. Just don't put me next to Harry. Put me next to you. <laughs> so I can learn. <laughs> I need to be someone next to someone that I can learn off, not someone that yeah. I can just suck up. No, Harry's up. a complete That's waste of time. Harry, yeah. there. Harry, you just you sit next to him when you want to talk shit. He'll give you. He'll yeah, give exactly. You from that, I don't know how much more he's gonna offer you. No, but no, seriously, like, like, uh, and, and real estate because like my brother's into it now, and he tells me like how, how much he enjoys it. Um, he's obviously, I've well invested. In, yeah, he's doing well. He's doing well. Um, and with investing in real estate, I've uh, I've learned a lot about it. So, and obviously hearing what, what you and Harry do when I come to the office, have a coffee. You know, it's just it, it really interests me. Yeah, it's 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 an interesting game. But I think, man, you've still got you've still got a long way way ahead of you. But I think just start just start trying to figure out what you can do. Maybe even I don't know. Once the second division opens up, I think I don't know. We're gonna try to take over a club and uh, and take it. Yeah, to why the, not, mate? It needs to be. A club exactly. for the people, by the people. And he'll just have exactly, a... Exactly, mate. <laughs> me, a family me, club. Eric will run the out. thing. We'll take it to the top. A family club that that, that, that players want to come to, you know, and, and, and support the jersey with pride. A hundred percent. And I think it's... um, There's a lot of room for the Australian game. There is a lot of room. It's the biggest game. It's the biggest game played on a junior level. By part surpasses AFL, surpass, surpasses yeah. basketball. It surpasses everything. It's just everybody needs to feel what we felt, Dino. And yeah, I it's, agree. It's as simple as that. Like you might laugh in the car when I'm driving to work. I still have the three Liverpool chants from the Champions League playing. Uh, it's Sergio Van Dijk, we conquered all of Europe, and. Yeah. and you will listen to them because it's just it's 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 with me forever. It's with me for bloody forever, and I I, I really hope one day I reckon, and I'm going to put it on record. One day we'll, we'll take a club, we'll take a club in the second division, and we'll get them to the top. I reckon. Hundred percent. That's the plan, mate. That's the plan. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> Done. I'll g it up. Well, good luck, honestly, with your. New venture at Sutton United. Six weeks you're going to begin. It's going to be an interesting season for you. I'll be following every single match. I wish you wish you the absolute best of luck. I'm so happy that you've reconnected with Steph and you guys get to live live together. And man, just smash it, just smash it. And fingers crossed, I'll be able to um to come and visit you. And if if I can't, I'll, I'll see you back down. Thanks, bro. Thanks for having me on, man. It's been a pleasure. No worries. Have a good one. I'll speak to you.